chapter 3. I've been dealing with you with communications, the tongue, how lethal the tongue can be. The tongue can bless, the tongue can destroy, the tongue can uplift, and that's why it's so important that we understand as we deal with communications in marriage, the family, our co-workers, how we communicate in our jobs, are we a fragrance or are we an odor? And that's why it's important that we understand how God desires for us to realize how strong the power of the tongue is. We see people that have that Leviathan spirit of gossip and they'll use that tongue, not for edifying, but destroying people, destroying lives if they can. And that's why the psalmist says over, Lord God, set a guard over my mouth. Oh Lord, keep watch over the door of my lips. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight, O oh Lord, my rock and my salvation and my redeemer. That God will bless us and help us over this time that we go through at times of temptation, of wanting just to last shout at someone, to hurt someone without realizing the residual effects of what it does to people. And so James begins to share with us the necessity, as I've already gone through some of these verses in chapter 3. But let's pick it up in verse 7. For every kind of beast and bird, of reptile, a creature of the sea is tamed by him. Notice, can be tamed by man. Man can tame every animal. God has given us power to tame. But the tongue is set on a wheel of motion to just destroy. And from birth, we have this problem of wanting to lash out and do things. An evil tongue can pollute not only a man's personal life, but it can contaminate all of his activities. And all that we want to do, we destroy ourselves by our own mannerism and how we express, how I use my tongue at home with my wife, my family, my spouse, my children, my grandchildren, those around you, your neighbors. It seems at times it comes out as a word of right from the pit of hell that we speak with no understanding. We have no refrain from anything that we say. There's so much confusion and misery when we talk to someone and hurt them. So verse 7 tells us, be careful for man has success with all kinds of animals that God has given us, but not in the area of his own tongue. We can tame horses, we can tame every bird, every animal on the planet, but not our tongue. And it's one of the smallest members of the body. The tongue cannot be silenced. It breaks all boundaries. It slanders. It even slanders its own reputation. That's how evil it is. Homes are destroyed today. And people's lives are hurting because of the tongue. Because of people not coming to the realization of what the tongue can do to people. How we lash out and how we hurt. In communication, when I get into the communication aspect, you're going to see how much more difficult it is to communicate and keep peace and harmony in the home. Because we lash out, and it can destroy the whole evening. It can destroy the whole atmosphere of the home and the children. The, everybody's infected by it. Even the dogs run out. Because they can see the confusion that comes within the tongue. And that's why it's important in those areas where it even destroys a reputation of oneself. Verse 9. With it we bless our God and Father, and with it we curse man, who has been made in the image 
of the similarity of God. The same character. In many ways, the Lord is saying, you are hypocrites because you want to curse God, a curse man that's made in the image of God. Verse 10, and out of the same mouth proceeds blessings and cursings. My brother, in these things are not to be so. It's unlikely. It goes against nature. It goes against the tide. And this is why, you know, it's, it's completely unnatural for us to do this the way God desires for it. The tongue that blesses God should help someone else to bless, to encourage, to edify, to uplift someone that's going through a crisis, someone that's going through a rough time. Instead of wounding them, instead of hurting them, instead of bringing a spirit that does not reflect God and our representation and our testimony that comes behind that. It is important to be able to love someone and they should ask, you know, Lord, watch over me. Help me as I speak. Give me wisdom over my lips that when I share, I share with love. Even in a time when you're going to correct your children, when you're going to speak to one another and the conversation gets heated, it is difficult to keep control because the tongue wants to just go. And I'm going to share a lot of that next week of what happens in relationships. But the problem with us is trying to contain ourselves and knowing in our hearts that we should do better. But we don't. We know that I'm going to hurt someone and I'm going to do it on purpose. So I can try to hurt that individual. Instead of saying what God's will is, what God's desire is. Before I speak, may God help me to be a fragrance to that person. Even though I can disagree with them, but to love them. To be able to get the assurance and the confidence of your children to come to you with everything and anything that they're going through. That times that are so difficult for them that they can come to you and lay their burden at your feet. And tell you, Father, Mother, can you help me with this? Mom, Dad, I'm going through a crisis. I don't know how to deal with this. Because if you don't listen to them, if you don't communicate with them, someone else will. And it will not be edifying for them. That's why it's so important to learn how to communicate with one another. Not arrogant. Not condescending. Not talking down to people as though we're better than someone else. But being humble, loving, respectful. Because that brother or that sister was made in the image of God. God created them because he loved them. And so it doesn't give me the right to belittle or undermine that individual. Also the psalmist says that we should remember that our members are to be presented as a living sacrifice to God, holy and acceptable to Him. That those around us can understand more problems occur at home when the tongue triggers something so quick. Just like a forest, take a match, throw it in the forest and watch what happens to that whole forest. That's what the tongue does to everyone, just undermines instead of helping. So we should remember that God desires that our tongue to be used for the glory of the Lord. And how we acknowledge God, how we acknowledge the blessings of the Lord, what He desires for you. So that you can be a testimony, a fragrance, a love, a connection, a conduit to those that are going through a rough time to share the gospel. That people can come to you and say, I need sound advice. I need wisdom. I need a word of encouragement. I need a word of knowledge from someone that I know is not going to belittle me or talk down to me. More homes are destroyed. More relationships are destroyed because of lack of communications, lack of understanding, 
Something so simple, we no longer go there. When we talk, it's a battle. It's a conflict. It's a raging inferno. Instead of saying, wait a minute, I have to remember what God said. I need to be a blessing. I need to encourage. I need to uplift and bless the Lord. Notice verse 11. Does a spring send forth fresh water and bitter water from the same spring? Absolutely not. It doesn't bring fresh water and salt water from this, the same spring. Can a fig tree, my brother, bear olives? No. Or a grapevine, bear figs? This, the, no spring can yield both salt water and fresh water from a sister. No, no spring can, can be confusing like that. So how is it that we bless God, bless God, and curse my brother or curse my sister? How can we do that? In nature, a tree produces only one kind of fruit. It's not confusing. So how is it that the tongue can produce two kinds of water or kinds of fruit, good and evil? Good and evil. Do you know how many times I have to counsel people and the majority of it all, they can be financially set, they can have all the things that we all look for in the world to say that we're somewhat semi-successful in our life and things are going pretty good, but the biggest problem of it all is to communicate. To communicate, it seems like we are so immature in communicating. And we're not that fragrance. And so when we don't communicate right, it affects the whole family. It's like throwing that match in the forest and everybody starts a blaze and everything begins to get crazy. And that's why it can't produce two kinds of evil and, and good at the same time. It goes against the nature of God. We are warned against using the tongue to produce the opposite fruit of what God desired, and that was to love, to love, to cherish one another, to be able to see the blessings that our children need to learn. We're losing our children at times for lack of communication. We say, look, you got a roof over your head, you got food in the refrigerator, you got a place to sleep, what else you want? They want to be able to come to a loving parent and express their feelings, their love, express the heartfelt problems that they have. Our children are under a lot of pressure, pressure from the world that is hard, pressure for them to have to deal with. And that pressure becomes more and more difficult for them. Instead of being a, a blessing that they can just come and and thank God. That peer pressure that they face of becoming adults, of trying to fit in with the crowd. They want to come to you and with something that they're feeling hard pressed in their hearts and the time they can't even come to you because we don't know how to talk to them. We're short. And whatever we say, quick, now, that's it. Get on with it with your life. Instead of telling them, look, I love you. I want you to succeed in life more than anything. But I know you're under this peer pressure of life, of what you're going through. And sometimes we're under a peer pressure from our employment, wherever we're employed, we're going through a struggle or things are not going quite right at the job kind of having a rough time and when I come home I bring that with me and I express my feelings and I pour out my anger and my venom on my family for something they know nothing of what I'm going through at work the problems that are there the things that I'm struggling with 
peer pressure that, that is there. <coughs> the fear of being laid off, not being able to make it. All these things bring in confusion. It, did, it doesn't let us just worship the Lord and glorify God because it, it brings calamity instead of healing. It opens up wounds. And a lot of times when I lash out, I want to lash out about things that happened years ago that I haven't forgotten. And in the time of anger, I want to bring it out because I want to hurt you. I want to really cut you. I want you to feel what I'm going through, whether you like it or not. It is incumbent. It is important for couples to learn how to communicate with one another. They have to learn how to communicate and how to love and how to express grace and gratitude towards one another. Otherwise our family will suffer and the words of wisdom are not there. The words of understanding are not there and we struggle. And you may have everything looking good, everything looks like it's going to be a blessing in your relationship. But when it comes to the communication aspect, that is the hardest thing. To deal with, to minister. You see, before I get married, I want you to understand, all of us are at our best. We're at our best behavior. Why? Because I want to impress you. And you want to impress me. So you're at your best always till the honeymoon's over. Then you find out you married Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hines. <laughs> Who is this guy? Who is this woman? And all of a sudden they're a different person because no longer are you having to be able to impress one another but now you're just being yourself and it brings calamity and that's why it's so difficult. So he says, verse 13, Who is wise and understanding among you? Let him show by a good conduct that his words are done in the meekness of the wisdom of God. The meekness, verse 14. But if you have bitter and envy and self-seeking in your hearts, do not boast and life against you, notice, and lie against the truth of God. Because all of us struggle, all of us have our moments. Yes, you're not perfect. I'm certainly not perfect. I'll be the first one to admit that. And you don't even have to ask my wife. <laughs> but I, I try my best and I realize at times I, I catch myself or I'm short fused about a lot of things that are going on in the church and the things that are going on and you know you just struggle with so many things and sometimes you just set that atmosphere ablaze and you say I didn't want to do that but you did it and that's a hard bat a hard time to bring it back you know once the, the horse is out of the barn it's hard to bring him back once you ah, said what you're going to say, it's hard to gather those words. I didn't mean that. Wait, wait, wait. Let me, let me take it back. It is very difficult to use that. So now James shows us the wisdom of the world, of what the wisdom of the world proceeds, and how the world reacts to certain things. The world loves to defend itself and project itself against man, against anyone. But yet the wisdom of God gives us the wisdom that heals, that strengthens, that blesses, that brings comfort and joy and meekness. Not like the world that brings bitter, bitterness and hatred and anger, retaliation, I'm going to get back to you. You might have won this one, but you're not going to win the next one. 
And sometimes we conduct our relationships that way. And that's why sometimes our children can't even talk to us. They're afraid to because of the way we snap, the way we come out, and the things that we say. We don't have a communication with them. And yet, James tells us the wisdom of the world and the wisdom of God, how God perceives wisdom. Think first, as the Proverbs tell us, think first before you say anything. Wisdom is a blessing that we are to ponder the wisdom of God that'll bring success, that'll bring blessings, that'll bring understanding in our life. And all these things glorify God. All these things show maturity that I'm really learning how to adapt to Christianity. I'm really learning how to act in a different way from what I used to act in the world. I'm really understanding God more than I've ever understood Him before because of the blessings of the Lord. But James says that this isn't wisdom at all at times when we just think that we're, we're actors in the kingdom of God. We're proud of the way I am. I'm that way and I've been this way and I'm not gonna change for nobody. That is calamity. We're proud of being ignorant. We're proud of being a rebel in the kingdom of God. That's why James says that isn't the wisdom at all of God. That's not the power of God. That's not the humbleness and the glory of God. Such boasting is empty. It's worthless. There's nothing there but hot air. And it doesn't edify you, it doesn't edify anyone. Such boasting is empty. And we're not humble. Humble in coming before God and saying, you know, Lord, there is so much I need to learn. So much I need to grow through. So much that I have to understand. And that's why the Lord tells in verse 15, this wisdom or understanding does not descend from above. We didn't get that from God. But it's earthly and demonic. It's almost like demonic type of atmosphere. For where envy and self-seeking exists, confusion and notice every evil thing will be there. It's all there. If we see the way God desires for us to be able to learn, we can't allow the world's principles to just kind of control us and guide us in Christianity and think that I'm going to live for the Lord because I'm living in a manner not pleasing to God. The Bible says that that type of wisdom is like a, a snake that is coiled up and ready to just leech its poison and grab a hold of someone. Because I'm going to retaliate. It's like a rattlesnake. It grabs that individual and lets his venom destroy that person. And we don't know how to communicate. And people say, well, yeah, but, you know, sometimes we can be funny. And we all have that. You know, we say something crazy or but when it continues, we become so arrogant that people don't want to be around you. And it's so hard to live with a spouse or a person that you love with all your heart under that environment. It should not ever be that way. In the spiritual affairs of God, it has to come with the wisdom of God and from heaven so people can understand you. So when people talk to you, you go, man, what a blessing. I know where I can go. I know who I can talk to. I know that I can find 
friendship and love and understanding. And my children can run to me in a time of need and knowing that they're going through a rough time. This brings healing. This brings restoration. This brings virtue in your life that we all need. Otherwise, we struggle. And I don't know how many marriages I've seen destroyed because of lack of understanding of wisdom of communicating. Something so simple. But I, I'm not willing to change. I'm not willing to make the changes that God asks. Just like he said, look how huge a ship can be. And yet that ship is moved around by a small rudder. The way the pilot wants, that ship can go by that small rudder. And we as big as we are, and yet that little tongue controls everything. How it hurts. How it belittles. And it becomes your biggest enemy in your home. With your children and your spouse. Your tongue becomes the biggest enemy of undermining, hurting, belittling, at the same time thinking, they got it coming. They got it coming. And what it does for the future, as far as being a fragrance and being used of God with a humble spirit, we don't see that because we're too busy undermining. Verse 17. But the wisdom that is from above is first pure and peaceable and gentle and willing to yield full mercy and good fruit without partiality and without hypocrisy. In other words, there are times I know I'm right, but I give up my right to be wrong so I don't hurt my partner or hurt someone around me. Yes, yes, okay, sure. You know, you take it in the chin. Okay, no matter what. You try to understand that part of your life. Verse 18. Now the fruit of righteousness is sworn in, notice, in peace by those who make peace. That peace that God desires. The wisdom that comes from God is pure, loving, gentle. And the wise man loves peace and will do all he can to maintain that peace and understanding of God so that they can move forward. You can have all the money in the world and all the riches of the world, but if you don't know how to communicate, you're making yourself an order. You can't buy that. That is a God-given gift that God gives us self-control and the wisdom to know and to feel the heartbeat of God in your own life. And yet you can be poor and yet be so happy together because of God's blessing of what God is doing in your life and you're a fragrance to one another and you're reaping the blessings of life because you know that God is blessing you with the peace that comes from above without sacrificing anything, without sacrificing purity and love. That's why true wisdom of God, the true wisdom of God is gentle and courteous. It allows for mistakes. I don't always have to be right. It allows for respect. It's very respectful with other individuals. Your children learn how to communicate by the way you communicate. Everything we see within our children, it's a picture of you. Your children model themselves after you. As I share, the fruit don't fall too far from the tree. So as they see the way you communicate, as they see the way you handle peer pressure, how you handle conflicts. Are you a peacemaker? Or do we come in 
trying to destroy me. Children learn from their parents and they will carry that on and that's not a good thing at times if parents are not being thoughtful of their children without sacrificing the purity of God. Because true wisdom is gentle, courteous, as I share with you, respectful, and thinks of the feelings of others, of what others are going through, the struggles that others are facing, the problems that are existing in their lives. How can I help you make things better? So James closes a chapter with the words of the fruit of righteousness, the fruit of understanding. But he tells us and he breaks that chapter down for us as ministers wanting to teach, wanting to preach, as God's calling is upon you. How do you deal with that? How do I deal with that? At the same time, learning how to surrender and how to yield. He said, be careful if you want to be a minister because you're going to have a stricter judgment because of the way you talk to people. And how you minister to people will be a way that God is going to minister to you. And then he goes right into the power of the tongue. How strong, how lethal, how deadly. How, how much bitterness is in the tongue and how we destroy one another. And then he breaks it down and by verse by verse and coming to that in his closure in the chapter that with the words, think, think, think before you speak because the fruit of righteousness is given to us from above. It's not something you're born with. I share with you, you don't have to teach a baby to be bad. You go through life teaching them how to be good. Because the bad nature is already in them. They know how to be bad. Put two little babies together, how cute and wonderful. And one year, one is trying to knock out the other one. No, 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 no. Trying to scratch them. Trying to bite them. Where did they get that? That's the academic sin that's in our life. That's just part of our nature. So you go through a process of them growing from, from childhood to puberty to adulthood and teaching them, from adolescence, teaching them how to deal with crisis, how to deal with nature, how to deal with people, with personalities. So they won't be so rough on them. But if I don't want to take time with that and I just think that I can just be as arrogant as I want, you're teaching them to have a hard life with the things they're going to go through. The things they're going to suffer because you didn't teach them love and humbleness and righteousness. It's given to us in purity and peace by God. But we've got to work at it. Man is so difficult to deal with at times. And how we make peace, how we love. Once again, James has us, and he says, I want you to see your trials, your tribulations. I want you to understand what you're going through so that you can grow through that and that your life will be a blessing and be a fragrance and not an odor to one another and those around you. <clears throat> the righteousness of God is like the fruit of the Spirit of God giving us fruit to understand the glory of the Lord and the blessing that God desires. So as we communicate, as we learn how to communicate, there are basic guidelines for us to understand. Where do I go with this? How do I, I deal with this? Do you know that men will work all day long? Listen to me, it's so true. And we will work and we come home and we live under the same house, under the same roof rather, as your children 
And sometimes you won't talk to them more than 10 minutes. And they're living under your roof. We don't know how to communicate with our children. And we won't talk to them. Sometimes it's just high and by. We're in the same house and they go in their room and you do your thing. It's not talking about what the, how was your day today, son? How was your day, me, huh? What's going on? How do you feel? What's happening in school? How's your friends? Sharing with them. Maybe you wanting to have a date with your child and say, son, we're going to go do this. My daughter, we're going to go to here. We're going to go to the movies. We're going to do something. Just to be able to communicate and show them that you care. There's nothing wrong with dating your children in a beautiful way. You say, you know what, we're going to go here, we're going to go do this. It's your day. I used to date all my grandkids. Pile them all in the car. Let's go. There we were like the happy wonders taking off. Where do you want to go? Chump with a chunky cheese or whatever. And we're going to go here, we're going to go there. And they had a blast over and over. My granddaughter said, Papa, it's time. What, babe? We need a date. You're on. That's it. So we can communicate. So I know what makes their life go around. So I know what they're going through. And then we can be able to talk and love. So I know what, what's happening in their life. Can I help them in any way? But if I'm not going to talk to them and come home, because I'm mad, or I'm grouchy, or I'm frustrated, and you just go to your room, or outside, or whatever you do, and just alienate yourself from everyone. Oh, he had a rough day today. But every day. And that's why it's important that we're able to, to talk. So that one day you don't say, why, why didn't I do something? Why didn't I try to reach them earlier? Why didn't I try to talk to them when they were going through this or going through that? Why can't I just love them and let them understand? Spending that quality time with your children. I'm going to get into the husbands and wives as well, but with your children is so important for them to feel and know, no matter what, that you love them and they can come on you. And they're going to think before they go out and do dumb things, they're going to think about you. I don't want to displease my father or my mother. I don't want to do something that is not going to be edifying. It's so important that we want them to grow up. We want them to find their way through the maze of life and this journey that they're on. And they, that they can find happiness and joy and peace and comfort. That they can find that meekness in their own lives. That's why we live under the same house. And even husbands and wives don't even talk together. How is job? Everything okay? Mm. 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 That's it. Nothing about what, what do you want to do. Talk about the children. Talk about life. Talk about a lot of people that live together. If they don't have grandchildren, they never learn how to communicate. They go through a life of not communicating. And they themselves don't know how to talk to one another. But they use the children as a centerpiece. We control ourselves with the children, but not ourselves. But the children, we will talk about them. But when it comes to you and your spouse, you don't know how to communicate. That is another problem. But the children, yeah, we will try to use them as a guide of of communication, but you have to learn how to communicate. Otherwise, 
That is a life that is very, very difficult. And spending 10 minutes a day or five minutes with a word of knowledge or a word of wisdom or a word of encouragement is not enough. We need to love them. We need to show them. And this tongue is evil. This tongue can destroy. Or this tongue can bring blessings and tears to your eyes with love and affection and understanding and courteousness. Or it can burn a forest down and it can destroy a family. And children are running everywhere and yet not with their father or their mother. They're afraid because they don't know how to communicate. Next week I'm going to be talking about the communications in the home between husbands and wives. I've dealt with children and that will be with husbands and wives. How we communicate, how do we answer one another? What are the beautiful things and what are the things that, uh, real quick, when you first were dating and you loved that little something about her, the way she laughed, <laughs> or you thought it was so great, oh my God, oh, it gives me chills, oh. <laughs> after you get married, after the honeymoon, oh, I can't stand up that. <sighs> And now you live a life together trying to take away that laugh from her. And she says the same thing about you. Same thing. She thought it was so cute. Oh, look at him. Oh, oh. No. I wish I could get him in a headlock. It's amazing what happens and how everything shifts in a relationship and in marriage. And that's why it's important that we understand this road, this journey that we're on. Wanting love and peace and understanding, but at the same time respecting one another is so important. So I pray that you will understand where I'm coming from. I'm going to do communication between husband and wife, and then I'm going to talk about the priestly duties of the home between the husband and wife and how we see those things that are today, up to date. The Bible is, is ancient in many ways, but history has a way of repeating itself so it's alive today just as it was then. And that's why it's important for us to realize what we're going through, what are the things that are happening in our life. Amen? Amen. So may the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the grace of God fill your hearts and soul. May the grace of God fill your homes. May the grace of God bless you, your lives, your children, your grandchildren. May the glory of the Lord be with you. And as you go, go in peace and love one another as the royal law of God. I decree blessings. I decree joy in your life. That the joy becomes a strength in your life. The Lord bless you, keep you, watch over you. Go in peace and tell someone about Jesus. And remember to pray for this church at 12 o'clock every day. God bless you, we love you in the Lord. Tell someone you love them before you leave. God bless you.